Hey, 6.15. Okay, this would be the moment where you start recording. If I don't. It actually started. She started it's on. already on. Good. Excellent. So welcome, everybody, to the... Uh, there's some echo somewhere. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the September version. Uh, the academic year has, has started. We are after Labor Day. I hope everybody has had a lovely Labor Day weekend. I went to a friend's place, went to their pool, and got me a pretty good sunburn. Um, at the beginning of the academic year, we will be talking about what the academic year will bring. We have three absolutely stellar uh, panelists today, Phil Bernstein, Leonard Anderson, and Charlie Portelli. Uh, they will be talking about what they are planning for this upcoming year, and then hopefully uh, next year in June, we will bookend this uh, with an event of the academic re year in review, where we hopefully get some students to show off what they have achieved over the past uh, nine months. So I'm very much looking forward to that. Uh, our usual sponsors are currently you know, not really required. We're not, we don't need uh, neither food nor, nor venues, but uh, Microsoft Imagine that AEC Resource and Consulting, Consulting for Architects uh, has been our friends for the past uh, 10 or 12 years, so we still like to give them a shout out. Uh, AIA credits, for those of us who need those, um, send an email to marketing at microsoftresources.com. Uh, Microsoft is providing the backbone for the AA credits for this one. The webcast uh, via Zoom is coming through Ilkai's company, Gen X, uh, BIM Consultancy, and 3D Consultancy. If you have any needs, uh, contact her. We're getting other support from Spatial Ops, RCAD, AEC Resource, and our friends at the CSI Metro Chapter. Uh, who we are, uh, you know, myself, um, James and Robert uh, show up every now and again, our uh, former president. Leonard is here. He's been carrying us all summer long. I think, Leonard, you've done like, what, three out of four events this summer? Um, Smita Ilkay obviously is around today. Uh, Ian will be hosting an event, I think, the, the November or December one. Um, Bob Yori is here today, and Alfred usually helps us with the posting and converting of the recording. Uh, September 30th, um, the date is set. The AIA write-up is not quite done yet, um, but we will be posting that soon and announcing that soon. Um, how to Pi Revit. Um, you know, Python and Revit, there's a couple of really interesting things going on. So we will uh, have a look at that in a couple of weeks. Um, Charlie and his team at Thornton Tomasetti will be having the, uh, their AEC hackathon and tech symposium uh, this year and then really interesting online format. Um, let us know if you want to attend. The members of the Revit Users Group will, uh, can get a discount uh, for attendance. And then for November, uh, we're still hoping to get Clarity, to get uh, Imagine It and their uh, Clarity platform presented as a vendor showcase. And on December 2nd, uh, Pierce Reynoldson will present downstream BIM collaboration on big hybrid projects. He's uh, worked on a couple of really large scale projects uh, and has learned a couple of workflow lessons that he would like to present. And as I've just said, if you have any ideas, let us know. If you feel like presenting uh, because you found something really smart, let us know. If you feel like you want to hear something about a certain topic a little bit more, let us know. Um, well, we're not gonna take poll today of who's around, but as I said before, marketing and Microsoft resources, that's your source for your AIA credits. So let's get to our speakers. Um, most of you have heard me say this plenty of times. Um, I 
just like reading the bio of a speaker. Uh, we all can read, we've read the bio. We have three absolute rock stars here. Uh, that's why we're here, right? Um, Phil last presented here um, his uh, book that he wrote, what was about two years ago, I wanna say, Phil. Um, obviously he has been a driving force in our industry uh, and on the technology side for decades. Uh, now working at Yale um, full time and uh, I'm really interested and I'm looking forward to hearing what he's got to say. Lenard, uh, yeah, I was already making the joke last time. I don't need to pre introduce you anymore. Everybody here knows you. You've been in yeah three out of four presentations just over the last summer and you know, over the past 12 years, I think you're probably the most presenting person we have. Um, thank you for that, by the way. Makes my life a little bit easier on the organization side. <laughs> um, okay. And Charlie Portelli uh, will be talking about uh, the things that he's been doing. Uh, I think there's two PhD students in the running, uh, especially for next June. Um, obviously, Charlie's been also a, a uh, driving force for the past decade or two, um, first on the computational design side, um, and now with Don Tomasetti on the, on the software side. So that's that. Um, I think most reading our attendee list here, I know that all of you are very familiar with our uh, panelists. So let me turn this over to Phil. Um, and uh, stop sharing and see what Phil has to say about where's the stop sharing button uh, what Phil has to say about the upcoming year at Yale in research okay well let's see I have a, I just put together a couple of quick slides for you guys so um, let me find them here in my mess of stuff that's open this is not class number two there we go sorry i taught earlier today so i'm still trying to get organized just give me one second that's not the right deck just sorry i've got like six powerpoints open here just give me one second and i'll get the right one there it is Here we go. Um, okay, so uh, first I wanna tell you a little bit about how I spent my summer vacation, um, which was analyzing and evaluating uh, how we were gonna run our building during social distancing. Um, we had, I had started a project, which I guess counts as a research project um, in the spring where I had my, uh, my, I had my building, which is a famous uh, brutalist building designed by Paul Rudolph with a large addition by Charles Guathme, laser scanned and converted into a Revit model, which we were gonna begin using as a facilities management asset. And we were gonna use that um, data set to demonstrate to the rest of the university, uh, which is a four or 5 million square feet of space run mostly with old disorganized AutoCAD drawings that there might be a slightly more sophisticated way of doing things. Um, we have we had a local firm here in town, Apicel and Button, who's a, John is a former colleague of mine from Pelly's office, John Apicella and Jay Button are both um, former Pelly colleagues. They were um, sort of working on this project pro bono to make a point because Yale is one of their major clients. Uh, and then March rolled around and suddenly we had to use this asset for a completely different purpose. So we repurposed our, our Revit model uh, to do spatial analysis, circulation, evaluation. We did some work with Bureau Happold uh, on some CFD evaluation and we became, first we became experts in COVID classroom and circulation and airflow planning. And then um, we found that because we had developed we kind of attacked this problem as architects. And because we had begun to develop this kind of analysis, suddenly we became the go-to planning team for a bunch of other 
organizations on campus. So, you know, we, we, we're, we worked out a, a barter system where the School of Public Health looked at our epidemiology plans and we did their architecture for them and spent the summer in kind of um, uh, intensive um, p- pandemic planning. So that, and that was enlightening, learned a lot about um, what do you do with a staircase that has no internal air circulation? How valuable is it to actually do a computational fluid dynamic, air dynamics analysis in terms of virus spread? And it turns out not much because while we know a lot about how air moves around, there is almost no agreement about how to calculate viral loads or how those viral loads actually operate. So um, uh, that that was a a short, unexpected research project that I spent some time working on over the summer. Um, Those of you who know about my academic work know that I've been teaching uh, professional practice here at the School of Architecture um, for over almost 30 years now. Um, And I've been doing some work with a colleague uh, at the University of Washington that I actually, I do quite a bit of research with her. This is Renee Chang, who's probably the country's leading expert in integrated project delivery. And Renee and I had an idea about three years ago that the quality of professional practice education, and for those of you who don't know about this, we're talking about um, understanding ethics and compensation, legal constraints, practice models, uh, the role of the architect in project delivery, the kind of the agency of architects and the large, larger systems of things. The quality of pro practice education is very uneven across the United States. And it's really uneven for a couple of reasons. One is, A, it's really hard to find people who want to teach it. Usually it's in a lot of cases, professional practice is taught by either some old guy who wants to teach before he gets put out to pasture. Uh, So he tells a bunch of stories about the terrible things that happened to him as an architect, you know, contractors suck and I didn't get paid enough money and you know, that kind of stuff. Or some junior faculty member who hasn't, doesn't have a lot of practice experience, but gets stuck teaching the required professional practice course. And the other problem in teaching pro practice is it's real because there's so many things going on around technology, uh, integrated delivery, uh, international practice, labor rights, uh, equity, uh, and social justice. It's hard to keep up with everything that's going on. So we formulated a proposal to create a video library comprised of 54 different topic areas in practice where we're going to find the, the experts in each one of these topics and build uh, teaching modules and video um video kind of objects that can be made available to young professionals or faculty members across the country. And you can either build an entire pro practice course out of this stuff if you want, or you can pick something that you are not an expert in and use those video modules. Uh, And we pitched this project to the uh, Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture and the National Council of Architectural Registration Boards and they're now funding it and it's in it's in production. So we're going to be releasing our first block of about 10 modules in the next quarter. And we expect to release 10 or 15 modules over the next year, um, such that by the end of next year, we hope to have a complete library of about 50 to 60 topics in this. So this is kind of an expansion of the work that I've been doing, trying to teach professional practice. Um, the other a project that Renee and um, Renee, who Renee is the dean of the College of the Built Environments at the University of Washington, uh, she and I and um, our colleague Marku Allison, who is a an architect with a construction company in um, Canada called Shandos, uh, we're doing a research project that Shandos is funding, trying to study the uh, episodic verticalization of the building industry. So we made a database of about 100 companies, big companies like Katera, um, smaller companies like Evo Domus. And we're, with our research assist, assist, assistants, we're doing, we're trying to diagram the ways that those companies are verticalizing. In other words, how they might be crossing one or more barriers of the supply chain to do one or more things and looking at 
what internal resources they deploy, what sorts of things they look for in the marketplace, how they connect to external resources, and how regulat regulatory and, um, and their consumers relate in an effort to try to understand what's happening more broadly in the industry. Um, the, you know, at one time, the integration was under a giant umbrella that was called integrated project delivery. But what we're seeing now is with industrialized construction and vertically integrated companies like Katera or WeWork, you're starting to see a lot of examples of this. And it was relatively easy for us to collect almost a hundred examples of verticalized companies in the United States. And so what we're hoping to do here between University of Washington, Yale and Chandos is uh, essentially write a paper on this topic. And we've, out, we've had some interest from the World Economic Forum in this research, so it may extend into a bigger project. So that's, a, that's one project I'm working on. Uh, for the last six years, I've been teaching a class in the spring term that I talked about a little bit with you guys called Exploring New Values for Design Practice, where my students study the business models of architecture firms and other innovative firms. And then the uh, purpose of the um, class is to create innovative business models that have non-traditional um, uh, compensation approaches. So you can propose an architecture related business that does anything that you want that architects can do as long as it does not charge for its time hourly or by lump sum. You have to have some new value proposition that creates it. And I wrote an article um, about a year ago in architectural design that looked at some of the innovation trends that I was seeing in having taught this class for about five or time. I'll teach it for the sixth year this spring, God willing, if we can figure out how to do that. Um, and I'm starting to see some trends in the typologies of businesses that are emerging. Some of them are verticalized businesses where the architect plays the role as architect and does some other thing. Some of it are what, or some of the businesses we're seeing are what I call spanning strategies, which is to create an idea that actually connects two parts of the supply chain. And then there are a bunch of what I call supporting strategies, people creating businesses that do um, materials incubation or design build, operate data collection or branding. Just it kind of very interesting to see when you cr create these kind of little Petri dishes, what kinds of new innovative ideas kind of come out of it. Uh, and then finally, um, oh, and I'm teaching a course this semester, this semester, forgot about this, um, with a colleague from the law school who is the, um, it's a guy named Lou DeBaca. He was the ambassador in the Obama administration who was responsible for the Obama administration's efforts around forced labor. And we're teaching a course called Fighting Slavery in the Building, in the Global Building Supply Chain, where we're, we have law students and economic students and architecture students, and we are looking at, um, we're, we're looking at the global phenomenon of uh, forced labor in building materials and projects. Uh, today, we happen to look at this work that was done in Columbia a couple of years ago called Who Builds Your Architecture? You may be familiar with that. Uh, this course emerged out of a project that we're working on at Grace Farms, uh, which is, um, Grace Farms is a nonprofit here in Connecticut that works on the problem of forced labor uh, in the world broadly. Um, and this course is, and this, we're all, Lou and I are working on a project through Grace Farms that involves a lot of New York architects um, you may be familiar with, where we're looking at this question of forced labor. So we're teaching this course this semester to have some students try to research strategies for how, re really trying to understand um, the relationship between acts of design and the implications for essentially slave labor in the building industry. Uh, and then finally, um, I was asked recently by the um, Royal Institute of British Architects to start looking at write, writing a, a, my next book. Um, there's a, um, you guys know that I'm really interested in the work of this, this guy, Robert Suskin, uh, who studies, um, I'm sorry, Daniel Suskin, who studies artificial intelligence and how machine learning affects uh, the work of, um, of everybody in the labor force. He and his dad wrote a book a couple of years ago called um, 
uh, the future of the professions where they talk about whether you need professionals or not. Uh, Reba asked me to start working on a book about um, the evolution of machine learning and design methodology. And so um, I'm, ju I'm just starting the thinking process about that. You know, this slide, this is a slide from one of my talks. It's a quote from Susskind that talks about how, you know, um, um, Deep Blue won Jeopardy and machine learning algorithms are replacing radiologists. And really there's not, there hasn't been very much work done on this question of how machine learning is gonna affect uh, the design profession and particularly the work of architects. So that's kind of the next project that I'm spinning up. So those are the things that I'm working on. Um, back to you, Andre. Excellent. Sounds fascinating and even more unexpected than I had not expected. I don't know how to phrase that. Um, so yeah, that was marvelous. Um, for everybody in the audience, if you have any questions, uh, type them in the chat box. Um, you know, somewhere in here, there's like the chat icon at the bottom. Um, that will pop up another window and you can type in your questions and we'll read those out later. Um, so Charlie, you want to go next and talk about what you guys are doing at Rensselaer? Sure. Uh, let me share my screen real quick. Share. I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Uh, most of the folks here kind of seen, have seen me or um, some of the work that I've done, but there's two, um, two classes that I teach currently. Uh, one at, um, uh, present from here, I guess. Uh, one at um, City Tech, where I teach uh, Building Tech 4, it's a required course. And then I teach also at Rensselaer, uh, which uh, I teach uh, environmental parametrics. Um, on the, one is a little more BIM centric, one's a little more computational centric. And uh, from the BIM side, uh, the class is uh, very much a lecture. Um, is I teach them how to do architecture and we deliver it using BIM. Um, I make an emphasis of not teaching software, but teaching architecture. Um, if you wanna learn software, just, you know, go to YouTube and you can learn that, uh, you know, for free. You don't have to, you know, get uh, student loans and get yourself in debt to learn these things. Uh, but to understand, you know, some concepts such as circulation, ADA, uh, zoning, um, being able to really compose some interesting elevations, taking traditional drawings and kind of adding a little spice and a little flair to them. Um, going over um, details, specifically facade details. I have, a, I have a soft spot for facades, having done facades for, you know, about 10 or so years. Um, so we kind of focus on the assembly systems. So the lecture, um, I try to actually make it as much of a lecture as if I was in person as possible. And I try to make this as much of a dialogue as possible. The last semester I kind of got caught off guard, just like most of everybody going from in-person to remote. And now knowing that we're gonna be remote all semester, I try to bring in some of the flair of if we were in person. So I'll call out on students, I'll do roll call. Um, you know, I do these things where I put the students in a situation where they engage. Um, so I've been getting a lot of good engagement from the students, a lot of good interaction from the students. Um, and so on. And they've asked more questions, um, which is really exciting. Um, and then one thing that I've changed is uh, for the midterm, at least um, the midterm grades, I've made a requirement uh, class participation. Um, typically the, for City Tech, uh, their grading criteria for the final is, is really based on your assignments. Um, but for midterm, it's kind of up to the professor to make their own kind of criteria. So as part of my criteria, I made um, 
class participation. And part of that is, you know, turning on your webcam, um, asking questions, uh, answering questions, because I also call out, call out on students. Um, and I've been able to get that bi-directional dialogue as opposed to the monologue uh, situation. Um, with regards to RPI, uh, I mentioned I teach this class called Environmental Parametrics, and it kind of encompasses these three topics. We go over parametric modeling for a good portion of the semester, and then we cover daylighting, and then we cover optimization, and we kind of end the semester um, packaging all of that together. All the slides I'm showing is basically all uh, student work. Um, um, and then with this class, this class is a little different. It's less of a lecture style class and more of a workshop um, style class. You know, uh, being able to go over some concepts in the very early phases of, this, of the class, and then we spend the rest of the class working through um, a series of exercises. Um, and then there's this assignments that are handed out at the end of each class. Um, with this one, the one challenge for this class was that uh, students need needed two screens, essentially one to follow the workshop and one to actually execute. So we've been able to uh, bypass that a little bit by having students, if they don't have two screens, they can essentially um, log in through their phone or their tablet. Um, and I, as we go through the workshop, I'm pretty descriptive of like where your mouse should be. So as long as you don't have, you know, the what's nicknamed the drunken mouse syndrome, um, you know, I can easily just by listening easily tell you where you should be clicking um, and how you should go. And so far, so good. Uh, I have I don't have any. Um, there's been a good dialogue, and there I haven't had any students that. Uh, haven't been able to to follow. Um, we do simulation stuff. Uh, we do a lot of geometry work. We tie that all all together, um, and so on. So, with regards to changes from you know last semester or in person to uh, being remote, I've actually reverted myself to acting as if I was in person and. So far, the feedback um, and response I get from the students and the interaction I get from students is uh, promising, essentially. Um, with that said, I can, I can hand it off to uh, Lenart. Okay, yeah, no. Lenart. Thanks, Charles. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna share my screen here if I can find. Uh, uh, there we go. Uh, all right. All right, uh, it's, uh, you know, the practice challenge in the spring was, yeah, the semester was cut in half and then we suddenly was thrown into a virtual environment and uh, it, it was mixed results. And I think this summer we spent a lot of times, so a lot of meetings with faculty how are we gonna do this? Uh, what kind of technology are we gonna use? How is it gonna be remote or not? Um, and, and uh, you know, this unknown was kind of a challenge, but we did prepare for full virtual, and that's what we're doing for the classes I'm teaching this fall. Uh, the, the design studios are the only ones to really come to, to campus, and they've been sort of spread out across the building, so you get the social distancing and so forth. But uh, the, the classes I'm teaching are kind of two in nature. One is the more documentation class, both for architecture students and uh, actually some construction management students as well. Uh, on the architecture side, it's obviously construction documents, how to create construction documents. Uh, for the CM students is how to use construction documents. Uh, and uh, we are going from hand drawing to Revit in one se semester. And it's kind of an inter interesting thing where uh, we, it's still a requirement for the, the accreditation to do some hand drawing apparently. So we are, we're front loading that. Uh, and that's been, a, uh, I think, the biggest challenge to move online where uh, I actually have set up two cameras, one that is, is above my desk, filming me, what I'm doing, and then a second camera so you can see me. And as, as Charles said, I, I'm try also trying to recreate the sort of live experience as much as possible in the room. Uh, 
the challenge I find is for the students is it's hard to read the room uh, to see are, are they getting this in the classroom I can I can pick that up right away uh, and also more informally move around the room and, and, and have a dialogue I find you kind of chopped off in the, this way in the Zoom environment. And I, I found a way of, of setting up individual meetings with each student, which takes more of my time, but that's the only way so to, to sort of compensate uh, so I can get a read of each student, where are they, what are they thinking and so forth. Uh, and even doing that online is not the same as when you are one-to-one -one with people. And I think the there's a great lesson in this that uh, you know the virtual cannot replace the physical as far as the the uh, flow and the passion in, in work and I, I try to spend in the classroom a lot of time trying to whip up some passion of what we're doing why we're doing this uh, it's it's not you know yes documentation and them it's it's uh, you know where are we as an industry what's how the, what does this do you do to you how do, do you fit in and using these tools that we're teaching and this this you know, special talk in BIM and, and Revit and so forth. Uh, and we got a new uh, head of uh, the architecture department, Harriet Harris, uh, end of last year. And uh, her focus is a lot about community, community engagement, uh, working outside academia to connect academia to reality, which I, I, I love that kind of approach and collaboration, obviously. Um, um, so, for the class we're running this fall is uh, actually construction management uh, focused. We typically have had a, a, a mix between facilities management graduate students and CM undergraduate for this class. It's called the BIM class for CM and FM. Um, but we're, we're trying to sort of expand and, and utilize uh, less about modeling, more about like how can this technology be used for uh, a better project delivery. So the key goals for this class is really enhancing the collaboration, obviously, and bring reality through classroom. Uh, I believe in really uh, using real projects or, or potential real projects, uh, real sites to bring a sense that this is how we work. And I believe that's often missed in academia is, is how we work together. You know, you learn a topic, but, but I think it's so important and I think yeah, also as Charles said, like you can pick a lot up on YouTube, but like the collaborative aspect is something you have to do it really to, to learn it. So, so we focus a lot on that. And that's the challenge to moving online, you know, also an opportunity, uh, I, I see. Um, and, and the whole way with stakeholder engagement up front and creating feedback loops. So we, we're, I'll mention, uh, we, we're working the Department of Design and Construction in New York. They're actually part of this project we're doing this fall uh, and, and getting them involved to, to actually give feedback. We're not designing this class, but the constructability review, how is it gonna perform? And uh, obviously on the design side, I should be upfront as much as possible as you know the curve in BIM where you uh, uh, save a lot of money up front doing a lot of this uh, uh, you know can do a lot of things up front but if you don't do the decision making and and solve a lot of issues up front as far as they're probably understanding uh, it doesn't matter if your technology is good you're gonna have a lot of changes downstream and then actually makes it more expensive using BIM so that's that human factor is so important um, for this project, we are doing a prefabricated modular building in Kent, Kent Avenue in, in Brooklyn, not too far from the Pratt campus. And we're really looking at, uh, and the big question here with DDC, we're talking about like permanent construction and per, uh, uh, temporary buildings or uh, quick builds versus the, the you know, buildings are, are treated as such a permanent things. And, uh, you know, if you look at in New York, I've done a lot of buildings in New York with DDC. It, 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 sometimes it takes a year uh, before you like reach above ground. Uh, so we're investigating, can we just put the building on top and, and sort of pre-manufacture and put it in? Can we, what, what's the cost of uh, uh, that time savings for that? Because it's very expensive to build in New York. Um, and the longer you take, the, the more you have to close streets and so forth. So really looking at those kind of aspects too. 
um, and the operational understanding, obviously, bringing the stakeholders in on board, looking, how's this, this building really going to work in the end? And, and I think, you know, as an architect, and I think I mentioned that in my previous presentations, that that's, I think, is a huge weakness in the design profession, that we don't really engage the owners uh, that are going to be using this. And they're the clients. They are the, 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 the people we should serve as designers. Uh, so, um, and, and I think technology really can bring that uh, into focus where you can start understanding, getting away from the plan drawings only uh, that the owners can't understand, uh, but these kind of virtual environments where you can get engagements. Um, and the last thing, environmental footprint, super important. Uh, how can we start using BIM as a, to start evaluating the effect uh, on the environment and so forth? So that's sort of the, the, the focus. Obviously, we are not going too deep in, in a semester and all these, but these are goals that we are, are looking at and, and being very clear with. So the participants this fall, and actually it's going to happen this spring as well, it's obviously Pride Institute. Uh, uh, the NYCDDC is the Town and Gown Initiative, which is their academic outreach and, and research arm. Um, which is great uh, and, and I love that kind of collaboration that, that, that connects us to reality. And this project might actually become in reality, uh, uh, you know, in one shape or another. Uh, also the mayor's office, uh, New York City's uh, Department of Homeless Services. We have people now uh, from these uh, institutions giving feedback. Uh, how is this building going to work? Now, I might, maybe I didn't mention that it's going to be for homeless displacement. So can we build the building quickly and, and do this sort of transitional housing and then disassemble it if the problem sort of uh, decreases? So these are the kind of questions we're, we're dealing with. Uh, we also are have Marvel Architects on board. They have a lot of experience in both uh, homeless uh, uh, building for, with, with the Department of Homeless Services and modular construction. So they, they bring another piece of reality as a critic and, and, and guide in this. Uh, so, uh, so that's the, the fall semester. In the spring, we are gonna do another DDC project. They're looking at some hotel spaces to retrofit them to homeless housing. So same sort of theme, but different typology, diff different problem. problem. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's very exciting and, and, and we ran this this spring and we didn't really go over the goal because of the pandemic. So we never really got there. So they said, let's run this this, this fall. But uh, the overall feedback though is the excitement of the students feeling that they're working on something that is not just a, a construction contract and a BIM model. It's actually something that has a purpose and the BIM is utilized as a, the vehicle to, to enhance the process and so forth. Um, so the tools, uh, uh, we now have migrated uh, something called Launchpad, that is uh, Amazon Web Services host of all the software. So the students uh, don't have to install the software on, on their own machines uh, because you always find people that have Macs and problems getting working. So it's been a bunch of days getting that working. Now you can access all the software we use through a website. So we spent a lot of time this summer testing this out and it actually works phenomenally. Um, so this is one of those things that uh, because of the virus, this is here to stay. We're gonna work this way from now on because uh, as long as they have internet connection, they can work uh, in Revit, Navisworks and, and recap the, the reality capture viewer that we're using in the class. Uh, we're also using Revisto uh, as a collaboration for coordination and things like that and I worked uh, phenomenal in the spring. We got the, that up and running in the spring uh, to not only between the students to do collaboration, clash detection and, 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 and review, but also the outside parties from the departments were able to then view the project and give feedback. They had uh, some challenges with the navigation systems in Revista. So we now actually today uh, had a meeting with Autodesk. Uh, they're going to provide uh, 360 solutions for us. Uh, so we're going to have docs and, and, and the build solution that it, that's, that's evolving. And we're going to look at some other things with uh, the old uh, uh, assemble system that is now owned by Autodesk too for cost estimation and things like that. So we're, we're moving 
And I think this, this, this virus is accelerating this transition into more digital, more cloud-based uh, environments because we are forced to invest in this now. So obviously you're not gonna just pull the plug right, and go back to the old ways. So I think there's an acceleration with this. And I think it's gonna be more of a hybrid model moving forward, we're still gonna have the classrooms, but, but also a lot of components of remote working. To start simulating in the classroom or, or in the school environment, uh, where I think the professional world is going. You know, I, I, for my personal, uh, with a company I started up, like I, I work so much more remotely now than I used to do. And the whole, I think, it, it, again, uh, the physical meaning is not gonna go away, but it's, it's could be a little more flexible, I think. Uh, so uh, here's a picture of the the uh, uh, building. Um, and again, minimal impact of the site. It's actually a DEP site. They have some water water uh, supply underneath. So the whole idea is to you know, put the building on top, uh, no foundation. Um, and and um, uh, we actually went and scanned it last semester. So we have a laser scan of the site, the topography and things like that. So we can analyze that. And we use the scan uh, throughout the whole process because it gives the context to surrounding trees and things like that. So, um, so, so it's, it's prefabricated as sort of kit, kit of parts. And that's where the, you know, the, the marble architects are coming in to help us just really guide us the best practices to how to put this together. Um, and, and I think, you know, what's interesting in this, we're talking more about assembly and not so much construction in the tr traditional sense in, in the site. And I, I think, you know, I worked for uh, the Leo Group, you know, prior uh, uh, for 10 years. And I realized that in New York City, how much time and how much problems there is for the construction time uh, on the street, the, the effects on the surrounding, effects on the neighborhood, uh, so can you cut down that time that you have to actually build a building? It helps everybody in the neighborhood and, and hopefully also saves money. So I think that's a very important driver in this urban environment. Um, uh, so it's a very modular, very simple design actually, uh, very repetitive, but it works very good for a learning environment that you can do large buildings, very simple, with a small team of students that are just learning this stuff. And uh, then, Hopefully, I mean, we, we, we started touching on that last uh, semester with the remote using Revisto and, and things like that. Um, how, we, how we can bring this together, even though people are in different places. And, and, and uh, so, so it would be an interesting thing to follow up and uh, hopefully I can get some people from DDC and the city uh, uh, and so they can give their view how this worked out because they, they can probably tell me better than, 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 tell better than me, uh, how, is this a good method of teaching and, and you know, breaking the silo of academia and actually involving more people in the profession so the students can actually learn how the real world uh, works. Um, and we're also, you know, slapping things on here uh, and testing things. And I think that's how a good studio should be. You can test sustainable uh, practices. Again, it's uh, for homeless people, but can you start mixing purposes? Because a lot of problems are often you build a building for affordable housing or something, and you get this concentration of one type of people and specific problems. Can we start mixing uh, functions and things like that. So that's another objective here. Can it be a community garden? Uh, can we generate energy? Uh, but the, the cause of biophilic facades from a mental health aspect, uh, because a lot of hopeless people are suffering from health problems, mental health problems and things like that. Can you create architecture, even though it's prefabricated, highly repetitive, but a, a meaningful environment? Because I, I believe architecture do affect us, our environments do affect us. If you create a building that is just boxed and you stuff people in, uh, it's, it's not going to be a good uh, a result. Uh, at the same time, being mindful of, you know, and this is where this, uh, the people from this, the, the, the city is telling us, I mean, you, it's got to be durable. There are people that will break things and things like that. Can you do these things? So I think uh, uh, we got a really good feedback showing how our modules uh, going to be built 
So uh, the expert uh, uh, from this kind of uh, a building saying, well, they're gonna break this thing right away. So that's gonna be more durable and things like that. So, and that's something that it's a little harder to pick up on a floor plan and, and things like that. So, um, uh, and we, we are looking down so the CM students, the construction management students are, are gonna go through different exercises with looking site logistic, very rapid fire exercises actually. So site logistics, what's the access to the site? Here's where the laser scan I think is phenomenal. Trees, for example, uh, you can't just like cut down trees and drive in. So how, how, how does that affect construction? And those kind of concerns that are very important. Quantification cost estimation. Again, we can just pull data and, and start uh, estimating this site. Uh, the sequencing, we're actually uh, using some game engine technology where we are moving things around because they're very quick and, and intuitive. So uh, like how do you assemble a building? Uh, and then coordination, clutch detection, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, and then the last thing, operations focus, the data that you capture in the building, often it's just kind of thrown out in the end and the facilities management people have to pick up the pieces. So really how uh, this gets captured uh, throughout and then can it be fed then for a running start for operation because if you compress construction you can compress the handover and get the facility up and running much faster that that's phenomenal because a typical building it's pretty disastrous the handover i would say it typically and uh, so that, that that's a place where i mean that's what i started my company is focusing on existing building focusing on operation how do we connect uh back to design obviously uh, so, so it's a, it's something I have a, a big passion for. But uh, uh, yeah, and it means the methods I men mentioned. So we break down the building. The, the students actually create a simulation of how the pieces come together. Uh, so again, less about software, more about using the software to tell the story and also inform the student to understand how a building actually comes together. Because that's very hard, like traditional drawings, to understand how it comes together. Um, so another yeah virtual mockups. So we, we're we're sort of don't we don't go too deep into each because we don't have time, but at least they get a flavor of these kind of things. And then uh, in the end of the semester, the three last sessions, they pick one of the topics each student, and they take a little deeper dive. And then in the end, we have a presentation where you know one student pre present on virtual mockups, one on uh, scheduling with with them. So they, they kind of teach each other in the very end uh, and you also get a little portfolio piece out of it, hopefully. So, so, um, so that's the outcomes. Then in the end, we are looking, DDC is very interested in it, and this is a research project. So it's an ongoing thing. Uh, and I'm very passionate about like discussion about building in New York City in general, uh, about community. Again, it's, we tend to look at the building, but what constant, what, what's the neighborhood? Do we care about the neighborhood? Uh, hopefully, yes, you know, and uh, the collaboration aspect. And then uh, last and uh, not least, uh, contract specifications. It's really in rule books, right? We talk about IPD and, and uh, so forth. Uh, you know, why isn't that changing faster? Uh, because people don't, you know, so that's another feedback loop that has to be uh, done where the documents need to be living document, not dead documents. Uh, that's I've seen in, in, in New York City a lot, a lot of times that the documents written like in 1965 or so. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, so that that's a, it needs to be a living, breathing document too to reflect the, the new things that are coming because uh, the level of change now is finally accelerating even more. Uh, and I think the COVID, because we are forced to become more digital and virtual, it's accelerating uh, and, and creating new opportunities, I think. So I'm trying to see it positively, you know. So, so anyway, that's that's my, my quick thing here. So uh, I will unshare my screen here. Excellent. Now, before I start rambling, which you know, you all know I can at length. Um, what questions do you guys have? Bob, 
I know that grin. I, I know you're you're uh, having a question on your mind. I, I don't. I'm I'm like trying to formulate a good one. I don't have anything quite <laughs> tied together just yet. <laughs> the grin is me going. What on earth can I can I answer? Okay. Um, I uh, let me start with Phil. Um, the the AIA here in New York is currently the AIA Justice Committee is currently uh, having this subgroup going into uh racial justice um based here in, in uh, the u.s uh, you know in terms of you know all the protests that are going on and that the events that have triggered and the underlying causes um which clearly goes into you know the 13th amendment into racism into slavery um so that that slavery research um first of all where can i go to get more information and where do you see that going? Well, you could start by looking at th some of the resources on the Grace Farms website. If you look on mm -hmm. Grace Farms, the Grace Farms Fighting uh, Slavery uh, information, you'll find some of the, there's a lot of documentation. And if you wait about another week, um, we have a big report coming out um, that documents a lot of the work that the working group has been doing. But mm -hmm. um, as for the, the coursework, we don't know where we're going. This is a, Lou and I are kind of making our way week by week. I'm happy to send you the syllabus. You can see what we're, what we're up to, but it's a kind of weird mix mm -hmm. of public policy, legal strategy, technology, uh, project delivery, um, politics. It's, uh, I don't know where we're going with this thing. And what we're really hoping is that our students come up with some new and interesting ideas um, mm -hmm. because they're really, no one's ever done this before. So we don't, we, we don't quite know what it means yet. I wish I had a more sophisticated answer for you. Well, that, that's all right. That's, that's the point of research, right? If, if you, if you ask any researcher and they're honest, they're, so they're usually saying, I don't know where this is going. Well, we do um, with that seminar. We don't but, know. We actually don't know. Yeah. Where if you're, if, if, it'd be great, actually. I think the, some of the, the folks here at the AA in New York would be interested in what your syllabus uh, looks like, and we, we might reach out. Yeah, I mean, it's really, a, there's, it's very much an extension of the work that started at Columbia around the Who Builds Your Architecture. Mm -hmm. But this, mm -hmm. um, because we got lawyers and policymakers working on this, it's much, uh, it's much more of a mix of uh, public policy and politics in addition to um, in addition to the more technical stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that's kind of what what we're finding. We're we're, an arch we're a group of architects who focus on justice design, on you know criminal justice buildings and you know courthouses, detention, um, and we never talk about the actual building. We never talk about you know what we can do as architect as designer. We always talk about what we can do as policy advisor to our client, right? Um, because there's so much more oomph in in a single advisory sentence than in designing a better door, whatever that looks like. Um, so yeah, that's that's why I'm I'm rather curious about that. Oh look, we got 36 attendees now. Um, good, excellent. <clears throat> uh, somebody here. Charlie got a question in the chat window. Yeah, Charlie. Uh, how have students responded to the remote learning? How have the students been affected by remote learning? What's the, the pros and the cons? Uh, Phil, what if, uh, Leonard was on a panel the other day, so I know his answer. Uh, Phil, what is what is your take on that? Your students' reactions? I think it's too early for us. We've only the semester is only two weeks long right now, um, and um, sorry, my cat has lobbying to be given his dinner. So <laughs> I close my door. Um, so it, you know, at the end of last term, we had um, the pandemic. Uh, was declared just as our students were on spring break. 
And so they only had a couple of weeks of classes, final reviews and exams, and it was all shock. You know, everybody was just in a complete state of shock because we had to jerk the entire curriculum online with no warning. Um, having had the summer to work on this, um, about most of our non-studio classes are remote. Uh, our studios are open, but um, I'm only allowing the occupancy at 50%. So we have this very complex dance of people coming and going and the building has to be closed during certain parts of the day so the air system can reset. And so we really, we're not into our rhythm yet. So I think it's a little bit too early to say. I will say that it does feel very, the energy is completely drained out of things. The building doesn't have very many people in it. The staff is working remotely. Uh, it's We're struggling to um, kind of build the community. Like we had, we, like for example, we realized this week that no one had given our first years a tour of the building because that's what the other students normally do. You know, they're in the building and they're all stacked on top of one another and it doesn't take long for them to find their way around. And we're like, hold it, we better get some people in there and show these people around because they, you know, they, they don't know. They don't know where they're going. They don't know what they're doing. And Yale has much stricter uh, behavioral protocols and um, occupancy protocols than the state of Connecticut. So a bunch of stuff that normal people could do, like go to a bar socially, they can't do. They, they can't do any of that. For the morning. So we don't know, we're, we're not exactly sure how we're going to replace that community building. We're, we're really gonna have to figure that out. What are you doing? <laughs> okay, you know, it's, it's a fair and honest response. Um, Leonard, a uh, question for you, and, and again, out of, out of my, my own personal background here with the uh, Justice, uh, Justice Commission here at the AAA in New York, um, the, the homeless discussion. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's a lot of overlap for me just as a justice designer um, between the homeless uh, population and the transient Rikers occupants, right? The, you know, yeah. homeless guy gets picked up and, you know, gets tracked in and out in for three or four days. So, you know, if he's unlucky longer, um, we find, or we have found, or research seems to indicate, um, housing itself is not the solution to homelessness, right? Mm -hmm. There's usually an underlying cause, and it is not always uh, loss of job and loss of income that drives people to homelessness. There's you know plenty of um, mental illness and mental health uh, problems that lead to homelessness, and well, first lead to unemployment, then to homelessness. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when you're, and there was literally last week, I, I skipped the the. Upper West Side discussion, the residency on the Upper West Side, because the AIA discussion was at the same time. Um, there's currently discussion and to bring single occupancy rooms for homeless to the Upper West Side. And obviously the very liberal Upper West Side found their libertar inner libertarians and said, not in my backyard, you're not putting uh, 100 <laughs> homeless into, into uh, you know, between West End Avenue and Broadway on 76th Street. Um, so are you, are you purely concerned with the building? Are you, are you looking at the urban fabric, at the psychological factors, um, or is, is this just a technical exercise that you're running through? I mean, I think we are part of a larger conversation, uh, uh, you know, it, both City Hall, City Hall is coming from the human, you know, perspective of it's a multifaceted problem. But one, obviously, the, you know, they're, they're homeless for a certain reason. However, there's going to be an even bigger issue now with COVID and a lot of people lost their income. And, uh, you know, yeah, they can't be, be forced out now. 
by what, what will happen a year from now. So there's a, there's a converse, conversation of what's really the effects of the COVID and that this tags on to some of those issues. Uh, the city has been renting hotel rooms for a lot of hotel, uh, for a lot of homeless people as a sort of transient housing. Uh, so these are part of programs of rehabilitation to get because if you are on the street, it's very hard to get back. So it's it's a you know obviously just giving houses is not going to solve the problem, but it's 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 part of a larger uh, program. Uh, but the thing of renting hotel rooms for homeless people are incredibly expensive. Uh, so it, it's it's looking from that perspective. And again, mm -hmm. um, I am interested in this. I mean, obviously from the social aspect too, but it's, it's one of those problems, but I keep, like quick temporary housing kind of, and, and the question of, uh, you know, getting away from a, a building as just the static thing uh, can be built quickly and dismantle and things like that. So it's part of more testing dif different ideas uh, and prefabrication, BAM coordination yes, fits very nicely into that. So. And if I'm answer, answered the question. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, fair enough. Um, oh, see page 75 is what Phil is saying. So we have a question, how can BIM, uh, how can we use BIM to help solve issues of uh, building material source in a modern slavery? Um, I guess Phil is posting his response here. Um, I haven't digested that yet. It's a little too much. Phil, do you want to? I mean, if you want to read, if you want to read about a brief that, two minute thing. <laughs> well, I mean, in, briefly in two minutes, the my thoughts about this back in 2017 when this report was written were really twofold. One was, um, if you're going to attack this problem, you're going to have to you're going to have to intermediate design and construction more tightly, and BIM is a is a good way to do that. But um, the way my colleague, um, Ambassador DeBaca, describes this is that th it is possible to use technology to create a, a view through to the end of the supply chain. And uh, BIM could be the entry portal to that. So for example, if you specify a material in a building information model, you might be able to interrogate the provenance of that material by saying, okay, I specified X, and then you could search, uh, uh, you could search data that could be accumulated in various ways to say, well, just so you know, this particular concrete supplier uses aggregate that's created by you know nine-year-old girls with hammers by the side of the road in India, or this chromium is mined by children in South Africa, or just just so you get a kind of early warning mm -hmm. of what the possibilities are. Um, but, but the broader questions have to do with um, shaming people, I think. And shaming is not really a technological question. It's, no, there is, an yeah, there is this application, uh, Kieran, where the Kieran on Timberlake developed for the Tally. 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 I mean, yes, yeah, I, I was there, I worked on that project. Oh, cool. I'm just thinking like, that looks from the environmental aspects. Yeah, the tally, the tally uses the same um, principle with carbon. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, at the end of the day, the end of the line is uh, labor rights policy in the end countries where construction is happening. And so, it, you know, Frank Gehry might say, I, hey, I don't have anything to do with the labor force on one of my projects, which is actually true. But what he could also do is what he has done on other projects is to say, if I find out that there's forced labor on this project, I'm taking my name off of it. I'm walking. So there are there, the, the question really becomes where are the leverage points and BIM's role in that is providing insight as the kind of headwater of the data flow. But there's a lot of work that needs to be done on that. Um, we're working with this guy working with this guy, Justin Dillon, who wrote this book called A Selfish Plan to Change the World. And Justin Dillon is actually a music producer who got really interested in this question of forced labor in the manufacturing supply chain. And he has written um, an AI-driven system that interrogates supply chain 
um, data that's out in the in the in the world for um, people who make like laser printers. So his clients, his customers are, you know, HP and Brother, and they are they use his tool to validate their supply chains to make sure that there's not in, inappropriately used forced labor in the in their supply chain. And so he's now he's gotten really interested in the building industry. So he's going to be participating in our seminar this semester, and our students are going to try to use his tool to see if there's a way to do it. Um, there's one thing, one, if you're interested in this topic, one place you can start is this, this website that I'm putting in right now called slaveryfootprint.org, where you go and you answer a bunch of questions about your own lifestyle, and it tells you how mm -hmm. many slaves work for you. How many slaves are involved in providing the stuff that runs your life? And right now my number is 33 and it's lower than Lou's. His number is 55. So we're running a contest for the semester to see who can, who can get their lowest number. <laughs> wow. That sounds like a really uncomfortable, eye-opening type of thing. Oh, um, yeah. This, this the, whole topic the, is extremely unpleasant. Yeah. I have... Um, Harvard has a bias, uh, internal bias um, test mechanism online where you can test your own um, inherent bias, intrinsic bias, something like that. I think intrinsic bias towards Implicit. racial equality, gender identity, um, all there's like a dozen different things by which we discriminate against others. Um, and no matter how much we say rationally, no, I am not that type of bigot. Um, that thing tests you. Um, and yeah, I was, I was not expecting myself to be all hungry dory and it came out just, just about as bad as I had expected. Um, and I was not comfortable, not comfortable at all. Um, I will yeah, I just went to that website. Yeah, I'll definitely do that before Great. dinner tonight. Um, Quite eye-opening. That is that is very interesting, and I think I'll I'll run that straight to the justice uh, committee at at the AIA um, because that's what what uh, we are all about over there. Um, that being said, one. yeah, it's not about me. I, I just saw there's a question here for Charles, but Bob, go. Uh, so thanks guys. Um, great presentations, everybody. I think this is a question, well, it's for anyone, but I'm thinking specifically, um, some of the things that you spoke about, Phil and Andre, some of your comments to that, um, uh, sort of the, if you want to say traditional way, uh, architects look to sort of redefining their businesses, whether that's design build or IPD or these newer methods that you're describing, Phil, it's about owning more of the design to construction and perhaps ownership and maintenance spectrum. But Andre, as you were, you were talking about being a policy advisor and thinking about architects perhaps expanding their spectrum, uh, possibly to construction, but perhaps in another direction as uh, a designer and a policy advisor or something that um, is maybe not down that sort of design, build, own, operate spectrum. Uh, anyone um, so, sort of wondering if you've seen that uh, or what your thoughts are on that? So was that question addressed to all of us or just uh, me? Anyone who wants to jump out. <laughs> but since you spoke first, Phil. Yeah, well, yeah, somebody else should talk since I've been talking too much here. I don't know, Charles, what do you think? You're muted. Yes, all I right. was waiting for somebody to say that. Yeah. And maybe for an hour without cases, somebody you're saying you're muted. Okay, yes. I think the policy topic is something that, um, as educators, we should probably push that further to have the students that are coming out today be more proactive. You know, we in studio and so on, we always teach these ideas of, you know, how can you make a you know, your studio project better in terms of like the impact on the environment and, and the social impact and whatever. But then you go into the real world and a lot of those topics kind of turn into fluff 
unfortunately, having worked at an architecture firm for, you know, about a decade and now at an engineering firm and I worked at a tech company for a little bit and all of their taglines are like, you know, we want to make the world a better place and everything. And then you realize, you know, all the stone that they are mining and all the glass that they're putting up and everything. And uh, yeah, there's kind of, you know, a, a low E coding or whatnot, but it's really just kind of, um, putting putting a, a you know a polished sticker on top of something and they're not really digging to the depths of you know some of these topics and and I think lead started to touch on some of these things from a sustainability point of view but that kind of even dropped off and then like the EPDs and HPDs again really focused on the environment but they never really focused on you know the the the, the workforce and, and I think well started to focus on the occupant and never started to talk about the well-being of uh, the people that are making the building. Um, and I feel like a lot of it is actually, if, if it was like focused internally, a lot of architecture firms would be held responsible for how they treat their own staff. You know, we went through the whole uh, Me Too movement, and there was a lot of public shaming of architects, um, and and so on, and this idea of the you know working for the star architect, but you're really a slave to the grind. Um, we need to we need to if we want to change that we need to start that from kind of the university level. Um, I've I've kind of went off a little bit on in a circle there and you know if i had to ask that question to myself like how would i you know in my classes teach the students to um kind of take initiative of being able to make a policy change um i had one student you know she she, she finished last last semester and obviously she couldn't really get any internships over the summer so she asked me she's like what can i do to, to you know, make a change and kind of progress in my, my career. And I actually told her to start joining some of the AIA lectures to have her uh, to start to hear other people's voices, um, to try to slowly get her in, engaged in, in an architectural community. And then hopefully slow in, in, the, in the future that can put her in a situation where she can you know, make a policy change or so on and so forth. I get a lot of diverse ethnic backgrounds uh, and cultural backgrounds in, in my classes. Um, and I like to have them each speak about their background a little bit and voice it versus you're just a number and you're just a name in the class. Um, so that's like the little, one little bit that I do, but I think there's more that can be done. I was, you, 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 uh, touching on something that, that again, with the Justice Commission, um, we have, we've just heard the AIA Chicago um, before this year and, and COVID, they used to do a uh, get on the bus day where they chartered a bus and drove a bunch of architects, young architects, um, to the state capitol in order to lobby because we are experts in certain fields, right? We are experts in how to shut down Rikers Island, which is a human atrocity. We are experts in um, housing. Uh, we are experts in, you know, civic space creation. Um, why not have that expertise be a voice in the, in the vast halls of a uh, legislature? Um, I found that very interesting. They're actually renting a bus and driving young architects to the state legislature in order to uh, lobby with actual expertise. Yeah, AI National has been doing that in DC during grassroots for years. I'm not sure what they have to show for it, but. Yeah. I feel like architecture schools uh, from or stu architecture students from, you know, the 50s and the 60s and so on, you know, you would see them protesting, you know, in their college campus to try to make a change or try to make a difference and so on. And that 
has disappeared. It disappeared from the universities. Um, so if you, if you, if at a young age, you don't instill a person to voice their opinion, what will happen at an older age, right? No, maybe they're not marching in this. Maybe your students are not marching in the streets, but mine are. It's pretty, it's pretty active here. Yeah, I would say so at Pratt as well. I mean, we have tremendous uh, the discussion around Black Lives Matter, Me Too movement, and uh, looking at faculty, what are the ratios uh, there? Who's making decisions? Uh, because uh, so I think that there is both good and bad, but at the same time. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't around in the 60s. So I, I can't compare. So, uh, uh, you know, were, were they more active at campus back then compared to now? I don't know. Uh, All right. I think we've got one outstanding question here for Charles. Um, your emphasis on teaching architecture first and software second. Uh, has that changed dramatically since going remote? Not at all. Um, I still make the emphasis on teaching the architectural principles, uh, you know, principles around ADA and, and safety, principles around egress and, and zoning and so on. Um, it's a lit there. It's a little trickier because I used to be able, being in an institutional building, you can point at you know the drop ceiling and the sprinklers and and so on and so forth. Now with people in their home. You can't really use the building as kind of um, your test case. You know, you can't take them to the staircase and look at the handrails and why the handrails extend a certain way and uh, why eager stores open a certain way. Um, so that has changed a little bit. Um, I still try not to teach software first. Um, <clears throat> software is the delivery mechanism of what you're actually um, teaching. So I've, I've done a lot of hand gestures in front of the screen. Um, you know, why is a handrail a certain, certain diameter, you know, let your hand go limp, you know, what is that radius? What is, what is that kind of situation? So I do a lot more animated stuff in, in front of the screen. Um, but I, I think it could be better. I think there's more that I can emphasize. Um, I'd like to be able to give my students a list. So I've compiled over the years, a list of buildings in New York that are really worth seeing. Um, and I'd love to be able to give that to my students um, so that they can go and visit them. But I'm also cautious uh, about, you know, them, you know, being exposed in public and so on and so forth. So I've kind of ratcheted that back a little bit. Uh, maybe I'm being a little too conservative for them. Yeah, I'm just glad I'm not the only one just isolating in front of the screen trying to get a point across. I, I found myself, especially when I'm when I'm seeing myself, it's like, oh, well, am I really doing all of that? Yes, I am. Um, sometimes I, I feel a little bit weird about that. Um, nonetheless, I think we've been on here for about a little over an hour now. Um, with uh, <laughs> Roger. Um, so I think I think Roger is uh, Roger is declaring this fall over. He's already testing his family's slave trade routes somewhere. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, first of all, to the uh, to the panelists, Phil, Charlie, and and Leonard. Um, this was just as invigorating and as great as I had expected. Um, you know, there, there was a reason I picked you three. I knew this was going to be marvelous. Thank you so much for that. Thank, thank you for all of the info that we've got. I definitely have a lot to, to look at over the next few days. Uh, thank you, everybody, who stayed on. And we're still 30 people here on, so that is always a – makes me feel good. Should make our panelists feel even better. You guys have uh, put on some really interesting content, given that everybody – stuck around till the end. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we will be posting the recording uh, within the next week, I hope. And other than that, uh, September 30th, um, very technical, back to actually, you know,
software, nuts and bolts of how to make the software work, how to, you know, get more efficient, um, how to pie Revit, uh, which should be interesting. We'll announce that uh, with the next, I'll, I'll be out on site the next two days. So I'll announce that over the weekend. Um, and we'll hopefully get AAA credits for that too. If you need AAA credits for this, um, marketing at microsoftresources.com. Other than that, everybody enjoy your dinner and your drinks. I'm definitely going to have some of those and uh, hope to see you in three weeks. Bye. 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 Bye.